new book, Galatians, shorter book, only six weeks of Galatians. Galatians chapter one, we got lots of content in these chapters, packed full. You probably hear a lot of preaching out of these chapters from time to time, but um, just kind of a real brief overview. This actually ties in, one of the reasons why I'm preaching this, it kind of tied in with what I was preaching on Sunday. Um, and Sunday, both services, I kind of hit salvation issues. Sunday night was on taking heed to unbelief, of course, which, I mean, most of the sermon wasn't based towards salvation, but there's definitely a big impact on being saved and having that, um, you know, versus, you know, unbelief. And then in the morning, I taught on having good works and how you could know if someone's saved and those types of things. But um, in Galatians here, I, and I had brought this up, we see a people here in the, the churches of Galatia that have really quickly kind of strayed from the gospel that they had originally received. And this is going to be a common theme. You're going to see this in, cha in, in multiple chapters. I brought up most of the references on Sunday, but there's even a few more in here where he's just like, you know, he, he's worried, he's concerned about these people. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, we, we get this information in chapter one, but there's lots of verses in here as well. And just in the book of Galatians, if, you're, if you go soul winning frequently, there's lots of verses in the book of Galatians you can use to preach the gospel to people because they're so abundantly clear. I mean, I've got my, my Bible highlighted, and this is in the book of Galatians. You can see like each chapter has at least one verse highlighted because there's a lot of good content and information, and he's kind of reinforcing salvation by grace through faith and that there's no extra works or anything like that added to it. There's a lot of good doctrine in Galatians, but we're going to see this just right from the very beginning. Let's dig in and look at verse number one. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So right off the bat, he's, he's establishing you know, that he is an apostle as he's writing this letter. And I think one of the reasons he's doing this, he's establishing his place because these people have already been turned around by false prophets, by people who are trying to insert works into salvation. So he starts off when the, in the opening of his letter saying, Paul, an apostle, and he said, this didn't come from men. This isn't some title that was given to me, you know, from studying or anything like that. It's by Jesus Christ. God called him. Jesus Christ appeared to him and sent him out and told him that he was going to do these works for him. And he was appointed an apostle by the Lord Jesus Christ to go out and do this work. That this isn't, he's not just, he's not just your average preacher, if you will. He was an apostle. You know, there's, he was the last apostle. And I'm not going to go in depth and teach that tonight, but there's, you know, there's only so many apostles, you know, there's these apostolic churches and stuff. They want to say that, that there's a lot of apostles and I'm an apostle and they're an apostle. No, but the apostle Paul was an apostle and it wasn't from men. It wasn't by men. Jesus Christ appointed him to be an apostle. And God, the father who raised him from the dead, look at verse number two, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. So when we see this, you know, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the, to the Galatians, you know, in, in Corinthians, it's to the church at Corinth. But this is to multiple churches. There's multiple churches that popped up in Galatia. And th this letter was written basically for all of them to share. And this is how the Bible was transmitted. It's kind of a secondary note. But people would receive these letters and these epistles as the New Testament was coming into being. And they would share them with other churches. So this one letter was designed for all of the churches in that area, in the vicinity of Galatia. It wasn't just one church. There was multiple churches. And they were receiving these words, and then they would end up sharing the other, you know, so like the church at Corinth would share their letter with the churches in Galatia, and they would share theirs with Ephesus, and they would, you know, and, and they would circulate, and that's how we even, you know, all these, these letters were maintained and would continue for years and years to come until they're ultimately compiled into one book. Um, but they've been received by the churches, so I just wanted to make a real quick point on that too. Verse number three, grace be to you and peace, from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. So, like, I mean, right away, he's just, I mean, we got gospel right here. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us 
from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, he, he's, you know, it's verse number four in, in his opening, and he's already just expressing how Jesus Christ is the one that delivers us from this present evil world, and that that's the will of God, right? If you want to know what the will of God, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? He wants this, he wants us to know that this is God's will. He wants you to be, God knows that this world is evil and wicked. And a lot of people have this false belief or understanding that God's the one, oh, God made everything bad and false and wicked and all this other stuff, and he's putting us through this. No, God actually wants to deliver us from this wicked, evil world. God didn't make things this way, but he did make us with a free will to make decisions and left it up to us to choose. Hey, do you want to live in a paradise? Or do you want everything to, to be cursed and corrupted? And man chose the corruption because, he's, because of sin. Man brought sin into this world and brought the curse and brought corruption as a result. Now, but the will of God is to deliver us from this evil present world. Look at verse number six. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, you could read this verse, I think, one, you know, two ways, where he says, you know, first of all, he's astonished. He's saying, I marvel. I I'm surprised that you're so soon removed. Like, you just received this gospel. You just got saved. You embraced it. You believed it. And how quickly now you're changing into another gospel. You're, you're, you're deciding to think, oh, well, maybe this is right. And, and, they're, and they're already giving credence or heed to some other gospel, one that Paul did not preach. And that's where he says, I'm all you're so soon removed from him that called you. Now, the him that called you there, you could say, well, that's God calling people. And I'm not going to say that's wrong, but I think he's talking about himself from him. Because Paul was calling them into the grace of Christ, right? Christ is a savior. He went there and he preached the gospel to them. And now it's almost like they're rejecting Paul and the gospel that he preached because he follows this up with, I've got a lot of other things in my notes, he says, which is not another in verse 7, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As, I, as we said before, as so we'll say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So he's talking about any other man. If anyone else comes and they're preaching some other gospel, don't receive it, don't believe it. And he's saying, why have you already strayed from what I taught you? Basically, hold fast to the teachings that I taught you because I gave you the truth, right? And they shouldn't, and you know, people do this a lot. It's, it's, it's actually kind of interesting how, and I don't know how often, how, really how often it happens, but you hear about it quite, I hear about it quite a bit. People say, oh man, I got saved listening to your preaching. I pray, you know, they get all excited to be listening to someone who's preaching the truth. And then all of a sudden they just get turned into some other you know, a heretic that's preaching falsely, that's, amen, <laughs> that's saying all kinds of just, just weird doctrines and even perverting gospels, and they get, they get straight off into these other areas. And it's like, you know what? You ought to stay. With, you know, when you hear someone that gives you the truth of salvation, that ought to be the church you go to. That ought to be the people that you're leading. If someone took the time and the effort to bring the truth to your door, but what do people do? They end up going to these other churches and just going wherever and going where their family goes. And it's like, look, none of those other people were bringing you the truth. Now, you may not agree with everything. You know, as the Bible says, you have many teachers and instructors, but you only have one father. And Apostle Paul was the one who was saying that. And he wasn't referring to the Father in heaven. He was referring to being begotten again and being begotten from another person, from another man, bringing someone else bringing forth fruit that he had brought forth fruit. That's why he talks to Timothy, who wasn't his biological son because he wasn't even married. The Apostle Paul wasn't even married. He didn't have any biological children, but he calls Timothy my son. Why? Because he's his son in his faith because he's the one who led him to Christ. He was his son, as many others were. And when someone leads you to Christ spiritually, in a sense, they're your father. Obviously, I'm not saying that they replace God the Father or that God the Father isn't your father. But there's nothing wrong with saying that 
I have begotten you. If there was, then it wouldn't be in Scripture when the Apostle Paul is saying it over and over and over again. Just recently, I had someone commenting on a sermon about, well, you don't save anybody. Really? Well, what about, um, you know, you don't win, so it's only Jesus Christ. And look, I'm not taking glory away from Jesus Christ. Of course he gets glory. We can't do anything on our own. Without Christ, we're nothing. We, of course, Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, that is the gospel. But just as much as he is required for salvation, he's also required us to go out and preach the gospel. And the Bible says that, you know, the, that he that winneth souls is wise. It's talking about a person that can win a soul. That you actually are winning the soul to Christ. Yes, Christ is the Savior, but we win the people to Christ. When we go out and soul win, we are winning souls. The Apostle Paul said, you know, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Save some. He said, he's saving people. Oh, I don't like when you say we got this many people saved. We did get people saved because we led them to Christ. And if we didn't do that, they wouldn't be saved. So there's nothing wrong with using Bible terminology that is completely biblical, it's completely scriptural, it's found throughout the Bible that, hey, if you're going to be wise, you're going to win souls. You know, on some have compassion making difference and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Look, we need to save people. We're saving their souls from hell. It's through the power of God, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, but we do saving. We do save people. And if you save people, you're wise. Because that's what the Bible says. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm getting off on a tangent here. I want to make a point here. In verse 6, back to up in verse 6, he says that they brought you unto another gospel. And he's giving warning about people who are preaching another gospel. Meaning that there's a gospel, and he explains a little bit further. He says, you know, it's not another, but they perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? There's a lot of people today that pervert the gospel. One of the things that came to mind as I was thinking about this chapter, and so, you know, because there's so much in this chapter, I was trying to determine, you know, what did I really want to hit on? What do I want to preach on? What do I bring to light? And when it comes to another gospel, I mean, I've already preached recently against the Potter's House, how they preach another gospel, right? I believe you could lose your salvation and things like that. And there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of people who come and preach other gospels, but one of the things that came to my mind is if you're familiar with any dispensational um, teachings, people who believe in dispensationalism. Now, the reason why this is even coming up, I think, is because, or, or at least has been brought to light more, there's a lot of people who subscribe to this, and a lot of people get caught up into this. You read, if you read your Schofield Reference Bible, which I don't recommend getting because of all the wicked notes, and the guy was an unsaved heretic, C.I. Schofield that, that wrote those notes. And, you, you know, if you, be, if you want to learn from Satan, you could read those notes. But if you just want to learn from God, just, just ditch that Schofield Bible and just get a Bible without any notes and just read God's Word for yourself. And you won't be corrupted with all these weird, bizarre doctrines. But people have been turning this, it seems, a little bit more lately. And um, I think because of the big attack on, or, or not the attack, but the, the, the coming to light, the revealing of knowledge to a lot of people of when the rapture occurs, that it's not this secret, preeminent, pre-trib rapture that's just totally proven false by Scripture. And people are trying to cling to this doctrine because they've been taught it for so long. I mean, whatever their reason is, whether, whether they're lifted up in pride, they don't want to admit that they're wrong, or whatever, whatever it is that's, that's causing them to not just accept the, the clear teachings from the Bible, people are kind of turning to this dispensational mindset of, oh, well, things are different in these different time periods, and this applies to this group of people, and this applies to that group of people, and people get really carried away with this to where many of them believe that there are different gospels depending on what time you were alive. That is, oh, like in the Old Testament, people were saved by the law. People had to obey the law and the sacrifices, and that's how people got saved. And then now we're in the age of grace, or the dispensation of grace, where, you know, they'll say we're saved by grace through faith, you know, no works, anything like that. But then they say, but in the last days, 
they're going to be saved going back to the works and they're going to have to have works in order to be saved. And that's nonsense. I'll tell you what, let them be accursed because what they're doing now is they're teaching another gospel. You say, yeah, they're teaching the right gospel right now, but you know what they're going to be doing? They're going to be saying, well, there's going to be another gospel. And if Paul is saying here, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that you have received and that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Why do you think that's not going to stand in the, in, during the tribulation or during the time when God pours out? Why would you even think that? As if it's going to you know, contradict the clear scripture that Paul's saying, hey, curse that person. Curse that guy that's telling you it's going to be salvation by works. And that's what these dispensationalists are doing. They're going to be cursing the people that are, that are going to be alive during the time when Jesus Christ comes back, which I believe is going to be in our lifetime. But Revelation 14 ought to settle this matter. I mean, the reason why they even say these things is because, first of all, they don't even understand Matthew 24. They don't want to believe that that's the rapture. So they have to say, oh, you know, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And they think that's talking about their spirit or their soul because they, they're probably not even saved themselves, which is why they can't even understand the Bible. Because it's really clear. But even still, I mean, if you're, if you're going to be so confused about a verse like that, it's not talking about your soul being saved. It's talking about your flesh. And read it in context. It's, it's, it's abundantly clear that, that it's talking about people, you know, the saints, the Antichrist coming against them and bringing forth tribulation such as was not in the world, no nor ever shall be. And it says that unless those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. And it says, but he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Yeah, his flesh shall be saved. Because that was the context of what was being said anyways. So they say, oh, this must be talking about your soul being saved. Well, if you have to endure to the end, that's keeping the works and doing the right thing. And that's, what they're, that's the way that they interpret that or understand that. And so they say, well, then we must be saved by works during that time because of that verse. Because they can't look at it any other way at all. They can't realize that their foundation is, is bad. That they've been building up this, this, this premise and, and wh wherever, wherever it is that they started going wrong from, they need to get that right. Now, in one proof to just show that this is completely false, this concept that people are going to be saved by works in the, during the tribulation time, Revelation 14 talks about the 144,000, right? This is during that, what they would call the tribulation time. 144,000 are sealed right before God pours out his wrath, okay? This is right after the rapture. But whether or not you agree with the timing of the rapture, it's still abundantly clear that during this time in Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. So during the, the tribulation time, you're going to have an angel preaching the everlasting gospel to them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. It's not the new gospel. It's the everlasting gospel. That means forever. Because the gospel has never changed. It's always been the same. It's always been by grace, through faith, believing on the name of the Lord, calling on the name of the Lord. That is how people have always been saved. It's the way people always will be saved until the world is no more. Salvation has never changed. So to say, oh, it's been by works, well, not according to Revelation 14, 6, because the everlasting God, you know, people say, oh, there's the gospel of the kingdom, and then there's the gospel of heaven, and there's the gospel of Paul, and there's a God, you know, all these different gospels. Look, there's not different gospels. If there's different gospels, they're false because there's only one true gospel. There's one everlasting gospel, as it says in Revelation 14, 6. Hebrews 10 demolishes, and, and read all of the Hebrews, 7, 8, 9, 10, starting from there, any concept or any notion that people were saved by keeping the law or by their sacrifices in the Old Testament. Anyone who says that to you is ignorant and I don't believe has ever read Hebrews in their lifetime. And they're just being spoon-fed what some preacher says. Oh no, people in the Old Testament, that's how they're saved. Well, look at Hebrews 10, verse number 1. The Bible says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never can never, the law can never with those sacrifices which they offered 
year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. It can't make them complete. It could never wash away their sins. No matter what, no matter how many times they offer, year by year, they bring their sacrifices. Those sacrifices can never make them perfect. Verse number two, for then, if they could, if they could make them perfect, for then they would, they, would they not have ceased to be offered? If that offering of the sacrifice could cleanse them, could, could save their soul, then, then why would you have to keep on making offerings? Why wouldn't they just stop then? Here's the offering. I'm good. Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. So once you're purged, that's it. So if those sacrifices would have worked, you wouldn't have to do it year after year. You wouldn't have to keep going back. You wouldn't have to keep bringing sacrifices. He says in verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So were people saved by offering up sacrifices? Were their souls saved in the Old Testament by bringing forth their lamb or bringing forth the goat or bringing forth any sacrifice and shedding the blood of the animal on the altar? Did that save their souls from hell? No way. Did that purge them of their sins? No, it didn't. Hebrews 10 says, it's not even possible. You can't have that. And if you read all of it, read all of it, God, read from seven forward, you're going to see it's not the bulls and the goats. It's not that blood. Those are all pictures. It's all foreshadowing. Yes, there are things they were supposed to do, but that couldn't save them. It was, it was just demonstrating that the Savior was going to come. God was going to provide himself a lamb that was perfect, who shed blood, would purge you from your sins, and would cleanse you. And having faith in that is what always has gotten somebody saved. Romans chapter 4 explains the same exact thing. People want to tell you, oh no, people in the Old Testament, they were saved different. And people during the tribulation, they're going to be saved different. And there's all these other gospels. Hey, let them be accursed. Because it's not what the Bible teaches. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. And look, this is the same for anybody. If anybody's justified by their works, you know what that means? It means the glory goes on you. It means you get to say, Hey, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven because I'm such a great person. Because I'm so godly. I'm so righteous. I go to church not just once a week. I go to church three times a week. Every time the door is open, I'm there. I pray every day. I give tithes and I give offerings. I help people out. I do this. I preach. I go so I, 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 I. That's glorying. If, it, if you're going to heaven based on your works, then you'd be able to glory, but he says, but not before God. Why can't you glory before God? Because you're not holy. Because God is perfect. Because you're still a sinner. Because you've done this and this and this and this and this. And you can run down the list of all the sins you've done in your entire life. And I don't care what day it is, you've sinned that day. Except for maybe when you're like one. <laughs> you don't have any sin. <laughs> not, until you, not until you realize right and wrong. But he's explaining here in Romans chapter 4, hey, if Abraham were justified you know, through his works, then he could glory about that. But not before God, because God's holy. God won't let you. Look, God gets all the glory. He gives you the free gift of salvation. It's not us. And this is Abraham. Abraham is Old, Old Testament. Abraham is before Moses, right? So before the Mosaic Law was really written down and kind of established, you have Abraham. Abraham was not justified by his works, by obedience to God's law. Did he obey God's law? Sure, in many cases he did. Is that what saved him? Nope. For what saith the Scriptures, verse 3? 
Abraham believed God and it was counted on him for righteousness. Oh, wow. That sounds exactly like it is today. We believe God and that's accounted to us for righteousness. We put our faith in God and that's accounted to us for righteousness. Verse number four, now to him that worketh is the reward not work reckoned of grace, but of debt. But him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Look at verse number six. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now, we're in a different dispensation, brother. Because there you had Abraham. He was before the Mosaic law. But now you got David. What time frame is David in? During the time of Moses' law. Is he not? Wasn't Moses' law in effect during this time of the Old Testament when King David was ruling over Israel? Well, guess what King David said? Hey, blessed is the man in whom righteousness, that God imputes righteousness without works, without the works of law, without obeying God's law, you are made righteous. Why? Because it's just the same as Abraham. It was by faith. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Hebrews 10 said that the blood of bulls and goats could never do that. So he wasn't talking about your sins being forgiven and covered by the blood of bulls and goats, now was he? Verse number eight, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin because they have eternal life. Verse number nine, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? Look, we're going to get into this later. I don't want to get into all this with circumcision because Galatians also deals with the same exact subject. And guess what? We're coming right back to Romans 4 when we get into that chapter. So we'll be coming back to this. But I just wanted to point that out. Hey, there's not another gospel. There's never been another gospel. Now, Adam and Eve didn't need a gospel until they sinned because they weren't unsaved until they sinned. As soon as they sinned, guess what? They needed the gospel. Even just skipping ahead briefly to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness, just like we saw in Romans 4. And then in verse 8 it says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, look at this, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Is that another gospel? No, he preached the gospel, not another gospel. Paul's just saying in Galatians in chapter one, hey, don't be deceived by another gospel. As he's talking about the gospel being preached unto Abraham. It's the same gospel. It's the everlasting gospel. Galatians 1 verse 7. Let's go back to Galatians 1. which is not another, and this is where he explains, it's, like, it's, not, it's not a whole, it's, like, it's not like a whole different plan of salvation. They're not just coming at you and just saying something just way off the wall, a whole new prophet, a whole new God, or anything like that. No, 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 they're coming in, they're using the name of Jesus Christ, they're using the Lord, they're using, they're going to try to use the Bible, but they pervert, they twist, they change, they throw in works to the gospel. And now they've perverted it. They've messed it up. See, the gospel's simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. That's it. That's what gets a person saved. But when people start adding, oh, no, you need to be baptized. Oh, no, you need to be circumcised. Oh, no, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to join this church. You need to, you know, fill in the blank. You can't commit this sin. You can't commit that sin. You can't do this. You can't. Now you're complicating things. Now you're frustrating the grace of God, which we're also going to get to in this book. I love the book of Galatians. And he explains very, very, very clearly. He says, but though we, he's even including himself, right? Himself and, if you read in the beginning of Galatians 1, it says, and all the brethren which are with me. So this letter was written by the Apostle Paul and all the brethren that are with him. He's saying like, hey, we are sending this letter unto you. Me, all the brethren that are with me, unto all you churches in Galatia. He says, if we or even an angel from heaven, if you see an angel fly down from heaven and, and start preaching to you, and they're telling you, hey, guess what? You've got it wrong. You actually do have to be baptized to be saved. He's saying, don't believe them. Don't believe them. The, and he says, not only do you not believe him, he says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. We've already given you the gospel. Let him be accursed. 
You curse them. You curse the angel from heaven that's going to try to tell you something different and preach to you a different gospel. That's what Muhammad should have done when he supposedly had communication with an angel. He should have cursed them because he preached another gospel. That's what Joseph Smith should have done if he really did have some communication with some angel. Mor Moroni. Moroni. If he did have that communion, if it was a legitimate thing, if he did have some, some extra, you know, some spiritual communication or something like that, he should have let him be accursed because he's preaching a false gospel. And it's so serious that he repeats himself the same exact same. I mean, how many times do you see that in the Bible where one thing is said and then the very next verse he says, you know what, as I said before, so say I now again. Just write one after the other. You don't see that very often at all. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. If someone comes to you and tries to preach a gospel to you that is not the gospel that you have received, you need to let him be accursed. And you know who this includes? You know who's going around and preaching another gospel and is actually bringing another gospel to you? The Jehovah's Witnesses. The Mormons, they go around and they preach another gospel. So do you know what I do when they come to my door? The first thing I do is I try to get them saved. I'll try to preach them the gospel. But they don't go there to listen to you. I'll try to control the conversation. If I could teach them and show them how to be saved, I'll try to do it. But if they don't want to listen, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let them be accursed. And I do that and I call them out and I say, you're going to hell Unless you change what you believe, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or you're going to hell and you need to stop preaching the false gospel that's sending people to hell and get out of here and don't come back. Let them be accursed. Maybe that's why they don't knock on my door anymore. <laughs> or very rarely. Sometimes I think they forget. But the la turn if you would to 2 John chapter 1. 2 John 1, real close to the end of the Bible. What you don't do when you know someone's coming around and you know they got a false gospel, what you don't do is invite them into your house and say, hey, let's sit down. Let's talk about this. You want to preach them gospel at the door? Go ahead. They're preaching a false gospel. If they're not going to receive it and they're going around teaching and preaching a false gospel, you let them be accursed. The last thing you do is bless them or invite them into your house and show any signs of unity with someone who's teaching a gospel that's sending people to hell. 2 John chapter 1, verse number 9. The Bible says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine... Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. Now, we don't always bid people God speed, but what that is, another way of saying God speed, God be with you or God bless you. Hey, God bless you, brother. I mean, that's a pretty common usage today of, of words, of, of basically something that would mean the same thing. God speed, what he's saying is that, like, God prosper what you're doing, God bless what you're doing. God give you speed to keep doing the work that you're doing. That's what he's saying. Don't bid him God's speed. Why? For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. If you go blessing a wicked person who's teaching a false gospel, you are a partaker with them. Now, this can be hard because sometimes, you know, especially when you're in, in gospel mode or whatever, you might want to say, hey man, God bless you. Or, or, or how about this? Have a good day. Even saying that, I mean, the word good kind of originates from God. You know, telling someone that, you know, it's like, look, don't bless them in any way. Say, get off of my lawn. <laughs> get, get, get off of my property. And you know what? Go home and don't spread that, this false gospel to anyone else. You're cursed. Don't be partaker of their evil deeds. Now, this is talking about people who come to you bringing, bringing the gospel, right? 
I don't believe this is just talking about any unbeliever, right, that even goes to another church. I think you can invite people over for dinner to preach them the gospel and stuff where they're not just like actively bringing a false gospel. This is talking about people who are bringing. See, it says they bring not this doctrine in verse 10 there. If, right, if there come any unto you, right, they come to you and they're not bringing this doctrine. It, what, what does that mean? Then they're bringing a doctrine, right? It's not that they're not bringing any doctrine, but they're not bringing, they're bringing a doctrine, but it's not this one. It's not the one of Christ. It, they're bringing another gospel. Those are the people you let be accursed. Those are the people you do not bid God speed, and those are the people you do not invite them into your house. Do not invite the Jehovah's false witnesses into your house. Do not invite the Mormons into their house when they're coming to your house and spreading a false gospel and bringing this doctrine that is not the doctrine of Christ. Be warned. It's serious. This is why we flip out. This is why I preach so hard on these subjects, on, on, on salvation especially. You know, and pe I've had people contacting me from Potter's house and stuff and they're trying to explain it's not a big deal. I was like, yes, it is a big deal. And you're upset. Oh, you shouldn't be using your pulpit to... To preach on these things and all this other stuff. We, you know, we don't believe the same. You've got a false gospel. You are sending people to hell because you are preaching a works-based salvation. Bottom line, whether, you, whether or not you want to call it that, I don't care because I've heard enough of it and I can see, you know, if it looks like a duck and it smells like a duck, it's a duck. Amen. And they're, they're, they want to repackage salvation to make it look like it's not of works, but it is of works. It's works. You can't con confuse the two. You can't confound the two. You can't add works into a faith-based salvation and, and not corrupt it and not pervert it. It's exactly what they do. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 1. Again, this ties in perfectly because this is a bold statement he's making. He's trying to make it very clear because what was going on in Galatia? There were men coming in and creeping in and preaching another gospel. And they, instead of rejecting and cursing them, what did they do? They were receiving them. And they were allowing themselves to, be, to get turned around and get confused from the very simple gospel. Verse number 10 in Galatians 1 says, For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You say, you know what? I don't care if this offends you. I'm not here to please man. I'm not going to say things and just be pleasant to everybody. If I'm just going to be pleasant to the person who's preaching a false gospel and not curse them, then I'm not a servant of Christ. That's what he's saying. If I'm here just to please men, if, I, if I'm a man pleaser, if I could just preach things that's not going to offend anybody and that everybody can all agree with, and withhold truth and not tell you what God really said, then I'm not a servant of Christ. Did Jesus go around just trying to make everybody happy? When you read through the Gospels, when you read the words of Jesus Christ, is that what he was doing? When people got offended, he said, Oh, Jesus, you know, when you say this, you know, you offended the Pharisees, or you offended the lawyers, or you offended the scribes. Did he say, Oh, no. I better, I better do something about this so they don't hate me. I better, I better, I better clean this up and, and say something nice to them. I better invite them over and give them a meal and maybe they'll be happy with me again. Is that how Jesus Christ acted? Not at all. He said, fine. They're going to be unholy. Let them be unholy still. When everyone left him, when he, when, he, when he gave that great sermon about, you know, he's the bread of life, and whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, right, that, that they have eternal life. And everyone, oh, man, this is a hard, I pff, can't take this. And everyone leaves, and he turns to his disciples, are you guys going to leave too? He wasn't worried about the people, you know, gathering some crowd or pleasing man or saying, oh, no, I'm just misunderstood. He taught the truth. And he taught it hard, and he said, this is the way it is. Take it or leave it. But I'm not going to try to wrap it up in some nice little gift and, 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 and you know, make it into something it's not. I'm just going to say it the way it is. The good is good. All the Word of God is good, and that's the way it is. 
If you don't like it, if you think it's bad, then tough. We're not going to change God's word in the slightest to please man. Oh, I don't like when you say, when you teach on, you know, that divorce and remarriage is adultery. Then you don't like the Bible. But I'm not going to please you and not preach on it. I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. We don't, we don't go around. If we go around trying to, if you try to please everybody, and look, you can never please everyone in your family, in your household. You could never please everybody. So you need to get that out of your head that you are to please every single person. You are to do what's right. You are to say what's right. And that's it. Now, we don't go around starting, you know, trying to start fights with people. We, we live peaceably as much as is possible. We don't just try to get people angry. We don't try starting a whole bunch of fights with people. What we do is just do what's right, what we're supposed to do. Just live the right way. And, not, and, and if that offends people, then they can be offended. There's people that get offended because my wife wears dresses and skirts. And my kids, my girls, wear dresses and skirts. And that, you know what? That offends people. So if I was going to be a man pleaser, when we're around those people, we would say, oh, well, we better change what we wear. So whatever. No, we're not going to change what we wear because we believe that God gets very angry at the abomination of cross-dressing. So we're not going to allow my family to cross-dress just to please some people. Whether they're family or not, I don't care. We're just going to do what's right. And if that offends you, then too bad. Because we want to be servants of Christ. Verse number 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, this gospel is not some man-made doctrine. And, you know, in chapter number one, he's big on the gospel. He's talking about, you know, cur cursing people who... Don't bring the right gospel. And he's saying, look, the gospel that I brought you, it wasn't just taught to me by some man. He said, this was given to me by God. It's by the revelation of Jesus. Jesus Christ revealed this to me. It's true. It's a fact. This is the gospel. Verse 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. The Jews' religion, he brings up twice, he calls it the Jews' religion. It's not the true religion. And that's why he's making a difference. Was the Apostle Paul a Jew? Physically, yes. And spiritually, yes. He was a Jew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He says it himself. Born of the stock of Abraham, of, or of, of, um, of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite. Stock of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin. And Hebrew of the Hebrews. He, he, was, he, he was very zealous in his religion. He, he was so zealous, he went out and persecuted the church of God. Why? Because the Jews' religion is anti-Christ. And you know what? The Jews' religion that he's referring to here, Galatians chapter 1, it ain't much different today than it was then. The Jews' religion of today is based on the traditions of their fathers. Like he says here in verse 14, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. That's what the Jews' religion is based on. It's based on the tradition of man and not on the word of God. The Talmud which is the collection of you know, Jewish holy books. That's the traditions of their fathers. That's the rabbinic teachings, teachings of rabbis, just traditions of men. What men have said, man's word, not God's word, is what they use to form their religion. That's why Jesus Christ said in Matthew 15, the same exact thing, essentially. In verse number 1, Matthew 15, the Bible says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, 
Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? So what are they worried about when they're looking at Jesus and they're looking at Jesus' disciples? Hey, why aren't they following the man's tradition? And they're finding fault with his disciples over their man's tradition. And look at Jesus' response to them. And this is what they were accusing him. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Saying, oh, we saw your disciples. I mean, you guys are out, you're walking around, and their hands are getting real dirty. We saw them pluck that corn and eat it, and they didn't even wash their hands. Don't you know? Don't you know in Sanhedrin and this in, in, in our Talmud, they said, yo, you have to wash your hands. It's got to be clean because that's going to keep you clean. And did God ever say that? No, but some, apparently in their tradition, someone said something like that because they were accusing Jesus' disciples of something that's not even a sin. That's not even against God's law. They're breaking the tradition of the elders. Who cares? Verse 3, but he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? He's saying you are so hung up on your traditions that you're actually transgressing God's command by keeping your traditions. And this is how they do it in verse number 4. He says, for God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. These are quote, This is from God's law. The Ten Commandments, honor thy father and mother. And in the Mosaic law, he says, he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. They're supposed to be put to death. That is God's law. But you know what? That wasn't their tradition. What did their tradition say? Verse number five, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father or his mother. So, what are they doing? They're saying, oh, well, whatever we do for you financially, that's a gift. You better be thankful that we do that for you as opposed to that is their obligation by the word of God saying, no, you honor your father and mother. And I've taught this before. I'm not going to get into detail on it tonight. That word honor doesn't just mean respect. You're honoring someone. You're taking care of them. You're financially supporting them. You are honoring them and caring and providing for all of that ties into honor. It's not just saying yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. There's way more to it than that. And I've proved that before from Scripture, but you could even see it in these verses. He's saying, when they say it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited, profiting is increasing, right? Nothing to do with the words that you use and the manner in which you speak to somebody. It's talking about profiting. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, that is what they did. That is what the tradition of their elders said to do. And, it sa and he says when they do that, they honor not their father and mother. And then they say that, well, he shall be free. That's just fine when you do that. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. He's saying when a person does that, they ought to be put to death. They're supposed to honor their father and mother and you're saying they can do this and it's just fine because the tradition of the elders said so. And they're trumping the word of God with their own vain traditions. Verse number seven, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This is the Jewish religion. This is the Jewish religion that Paul came out of. This is the Jewish religion that's being taught today. They, are not, they do not believe the Old Testament just without Jesus Christ, like many people want to tell you. Like these, these conservative Republicans that want to stand with Israel, right? Because they're God's people. They're Antichrist. Who's over denying that Jesus is the Christ? They're Antichrist. They're a liar. We don't need to be yoking up with them. Let's not be blessing the wicked. We don't pray for them. Let's go back to Galatians 1. We're almost done. I'm going to wrap up this chapter. <clears throat> but don't worry. We're going to get back into the, the Jew topic as well when we get to Galatians 3. So we've got, we've got a lot to cover in this book. 
Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be careful. I might, I might even have to split up one of these chapters into two weeks. I don't want to do that, but there's, ju- there's just so much that needs to be preached on out of, these, out of this book. We'll, um, we'll see when we get there. Verse number 15, I think, is where we left off. Galatians 1.15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. This is an important verse. I, I, you know, don't get worried about verses like this. And see, what happens is sometimes people get troubled by certain verses, not because it should be troubling at all, but because there are people who have false doctrine that try to use certain verses to support their false doctrine, even though they're not difficult to understand at all and should pose no problem. But someone who's a Calvinist might say, see, God picks and chooses, you know, who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. And that's not what this says at all. But they'll try to use a verse like this to support that. But no, God, and, and we see verses like this in, I think, like Jeremiah has a similar verse that says that, you know, God's chosen him from, from birth. He formed and fashioned him. And, and he's, Paul's saying he separated me from my mother's womb. What does that mean? God had a plan for Paul's life from when he was born, from before he was born. I believe God has a plan for everybody's life. God has a, a, a direction that he wants you to take. God has a path for you individually to follow just as he had a path for the Apostle Paul to follow. But not everybody walks in the will of God. Sometimes the plan has to change because he's given us the ability to choose. Paul could have chosen the wrong way. He had the ability to. God didn't force him to. Now, he chose him. He planned it. He had a plan and wanted him to do certain things. And we even see in in the Apostle Paul's life, there are things that he is being warned about, like not to go to Jerusalem, by men who are preaching in the Word of God, in the Spirit, and warning him, hey, don't do this. Don't go this direction, Paul. Don't go and do it. And he does it anyways. We have the ability to not do exactly according to the will of God. But it's amazing and great to realize that, you know what, God does have a plan for me, for little old me, who feels like maybe a nobody sometimes. What can I possibly do? Well, you know what you can do? Try to walk in God's will. And there's nothing, there's nothing greater that you can do than do what God wants you to do. God has chosen and separated certain people for different tasks, but all of those are found in Scripture. God didn't choose everybody to pastor a church. God didn't choose everybody to go out and be a missionary. God didn't choose everybody to do all these various jobs that exist. But he's chosen a job for you to do. And just because that job isn't some other job that might get a lot of glory on this earth, you don't have to be worried about that. Because, I mean, when you really think about it at the end of the day, does it matter more how much credit you get and how many people seem to be following you or whatever? Is that more important than just saying, God, what you want me to do, I'll do it. And if you are exactly where God wants you to be, nothing can be better than that. No matter what you think is better than that, nothing is better than that. Because you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. God wanted the Apostle Paul to be a, you know, preach to the Gentiles. And he did that. That's the best thing he could have done. He could have done things differently. He could have settled. He could have got a family. He could have you know, maybe even passed a church. But that wasn't exactly what God wanted him to do. And he probably could have had a great church and he probably still would have done other things and served God and, and still done you know, a lot of great works. But the best thing for him to do was exactly what God had for him to do. So we need to be sensitive in our own lives to being willing to do what God has for us to do, whatever that may be, and allow yourself to be led of the Spirit, 
read the Bible regularly, work on getting sin out of your life, and just submitting to the will of God. And you may not realize it as you're going and doing things, but if you're doing what's right regularly, you'll be able to look back later and see, oh, this is how God was preparing my life. All of these events that happened, it comes clear and it makes a lot more sense. But along the whole path, you have free will, but you don't want to be anywhere other than doing what, what God has called for you to do. And don't feel like, so lost, like I don't know what God's will is. You don't have to worry about it that much because we have God's will right here. Focus on this first and foremost. Don't get too worried about too much, right? Be doing this. You'll be getting guidance. You'll be getting opportunities. Doors will open up in front of you if you're walking in God's will in the path that God wants you to take. And, I, and I, you know, I'm a firm believer, you know, Brother Freeman, who, who's in South Korea right now, I think is a good example. Is I, after hearing all the stories, you know, he only, when he came up and preached that sermon right before he left, he didn't even divulge like, everything that happened. There's still some more. So like, I heard more than even what he had, had said on that evening. And to me, that's a good example of someone who is committed to following God, someone who's very faithful, someone who's, who's concerned about just doing what's right, and ends up, you know, being in an area where that wasn't his plan. That's not what he was thinking about doing. Or, you know, there's a lot of things, I'm sure, that have happened in his life just in the past year that he had no idea were, was going to be the way they are. But that's where he is. And, and, you know, it may not be that extreme of going, you know, halfway across the world or whatever. It could be very minor in, in, in physical locations, things like that. But we don't have to just stress or fret over where does it exactly God wants me to be. Just try and do as much as you can for the Lord. And when God sees the willing heart, when God sees you doing, already following instruction, He'll lead you. And you'll end up where He wants you to be. But He has a plan for you. Just as He has a plan for Paul. I believe from, from before you were born, God had a desire for every single person. Saved and unsaved. He wants the unsaved to get saved. He had a plan for them to get saved. He had a minister appointed for them to get saved. God had everything ready to go, but not everyone gets saved because they have a choice. We are not robots. We are not Calvinists. We don't believe that God is just picking and choosing absolutely everything. It's, up to, it's still up to us to fulfill his will. Look at verse number 16. Well, let's, I'll read, read, read verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again in Damascus. Now, he's saying this because he said, once I knew because Jesus Christ appeared to him and told him what he was supposed to do. Once I knew what it was that God had for me to do, I didn't need to go and talk to anybody else. I didn't need to go get permission from James and John. I didn't need to go talk to Peter. I didn't need to get an okay from anyone else to say, okay, well, this is what I'm planning on doing. Can you, you know? No, he says, when I, when, when I got the calling from God, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. I didn't go and talk to anyone else or get permission. They didn't have the authority. Jesus has the authority. He told me to do this. That's what I'm going to do. Now, I'm all for people in churches, wherever you're at, giving respect, honor, authority unto a pastor. But I'll tell you what, you don't need permission to go out soul winning. You don't need permission to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to an unbeliever. You don't have to ask your pastor permission, can I go out soul winning? You just do it because Jesus told you to do it. And there's many things like that that God has told us to do in his word that you don't need to go asking permission for. You just do it because God said so. 
Now, you may want to ask permission, can I use your literature, right? Because you don't need literature. You could have this literature, and this is all you need to win a soul. You could ask to say, well, I want to give out our church invitations and things like that. Yeah, ask for that. That's appropriate. But you don't have to ask to go out soul winning. You don't have to ask to do what's right. You don't have to ask permission from anybody to read the Bible, to pray, to, you know, whatever. You don't need that permission. And, and the Apostle Paul knew, I don't, you know, he just got saved. He literally just got saved and he didn't need to go and say, oh, well, you guys are way smarter than me because you've been in this for so long and everything else. The instructions were clear. If, you, if you're not clear on the instructions, yeah, of course, counseling is good, get, you know, getting advice and opinion on things. But when you see clear instructions, you, know, you don't need anyone else to tell you because you know what's going to happen if you, if you go to someone when you already have clear instructions? You might just get misled because you might hear something that you want to hear instead of just hearing what it says. What if they told you, well, you're brand new. We need to check and make sure you're saved. Why don't you stay around here? You, we, can, we can build you up. We can show you the ropes. We can show you how we do things. And then you can go off and do this work. Well, that's not what God told him to do. If that's what God wanted him to do, he would have told him to do that. But see, if he would have gone and just said, well, I don't know, is this really what God wanted me to do? Well, it's what he said. We don't need to, to struggle with that. And he didn't struggle with that. And he's saying it plainly, look, I didn't go up to them that were apostles before me. I just did it. And then he explains when he comes back, he's like, you know, after years, you know, I come back and then I get to meet a couple of these guys and, you know, whatever. And they gave me the right hand of fellowship and, and everything's good, but... You know, I, didn't, I don't need permission from them. I mean, yeah, praise God, they're doing a work for the Lord and, and they should have respect and everything like that, but they're still men. And our authority comes from God. They didn't establish the Roman Catholic Church contrary to what the Catholics want to tell you. The Apostle Peter was not the first pope. There's only one papa. There's only one pope, and that's God. Call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. And if you want to know what Pope means, it's Pope, Papa. Call the priest's father. Oh, father so-and-so. No. Jesus said not to call him father. Let's finish up this chapter. Verse number 18. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. We were there for a couple weeks. But other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. Judea is where it all started, right? They were in Judah. They were the Jews, right? The Jews that got saved in Jerusalem. He's saying, I, they didn't even, they've never even seen my face. They didn't need to. But you know what they did? They heard about what he was doing. Verse 23 says, but when they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Wow, this guy who was real zealous about going after and going to different cities and put him into prison and seeing him put to death, that same guy now is on the other side. He's on the right team. He's preaching the gospel that once he was out to destroy. Wow, what a powerful testimony. Wow, how cool is that? Wow, praise the Lord. And that's what they did. And verse 24 says, and they glorified God in me. And this is the testimony that we want to have. It wasn't, the Apostle Paul, it wasn't about him. He didn't go around. He wasn't the one going around saying how much he did all this stuff in his life, but I changed. I turned everything around. Man, when I got saved, I gave up this and gave up that. And it, look, even if he did that, right? Because he, I mean, he gave up being a Pharisee because you have to, you know, change what you believe. He wasn't bringing the glory on himself. He says, they heard that I was doing this. His actions did the talking for him. His actions of preaching the gospel, his actions of being bold, his actions of winning people to Christ. Yeah, other people were talking about that. He wasn't blowing his own horn ever. 
And as a result, people can glorify God through him, but, you know, in him, but not, but it wasn't about him. They weren't glorifying Paul. They're glorifying God. Hey, praise God. God even saves a man like this. And now he's off doing these great works for God. Praise God for the power of God to save someone like that, to, to, to work in someone's life like that. And to work in a life where many people might think, wow, I've done so much damage. How can I ever do anything for God? He must hate me. He must be done with me. I mean, I was out to kill people and throw them in prison. But the Apostle Paul didn't have that attitude. No, he said, this is what God wants me to do. Hey, I did these things ignorantly before I was in unbelief. I didn't understand. I didn't believe. I wasn't saved. Whatever you've done in your life before you got saved, hey, forget about those things which are befined and reach forward to those things which are set before you and press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Call, you know, press forward. Don't worry about the things of the past. Keep pushing forward. Keep trying to maintain the will of God and if you're in where God has for you to be, then there is no place better to be. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful book of the Bible, dear Lord, and for um, saving us, dear God, and being able to use us and wanting to use us, dear Lord, even though we're, we're this weak uh, flesh body, and, and, but you've given us a strong spirit. God, we ask that you would please stir up our spirit and help us to walk in that spirit and to walk in your will and to know what that is. Please lead us, direct us every step of the way, dear Lord, that we can do exactly what it is that you have for us to do in this life. God, we thank you for, for giving us this instruction and for not making it complicated, but very simple, Lord. Help us to, to understand these words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.